And again, this isn't me telling everybody how to do things. Like, that's freaking stupid. Don't do any of this crap. Don't do it. You're going to die. I said that in the last video with the interview with the CrossFitter. Don't do it because you're going to freaking die. They had doctors in this study. They were freaking scientists conducting the study. I don't want anyone saying, oh, I did this thing and Andrew said it was okay. It's like, I'm not saying it's okay. I'm saying it's not okay. Don't be freaking idiot. Yo, so this one's cool. It's cool because it's science and it's really hard to argue with science. It's a test that was done. It's from a journal, the National Strength and Conditioning Association posted it. It's in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research from 2007, peer reviewed. So it's very hard to argue with this stuff. The test is titled, the effect of short-term use of testosterone and entate on muscular strength and power in healthy young men. And this is something that I mentioned in my initial steroid video, like steroids and CrossFit, everything you need to know. It's something that I stumbled upon and went into back in the quarantine days where I tried to pick up every piece of information I could on performance enhancing drugs. It's why I know so much about it because I did stuff like reading this. I reached out to some people. I wanted to hear their take. Like, what did you say? How was it? What do you know about this sort of crap? Everything under the sun, I tried to freaking throw it into my brain. Knowledge is power and I wanted all the knowledge I could have on the subject of performance enhancing drugs in relation to the sport of CrossFit. I just wanted to know everything. And a lot of people wanted to know about this article in particular. So I'm, today I'm going to cover the article. I'm going to tell you everything about this article because it's super interesting. And it covers exactly what the title says, the effect of short-term use, strength and power muscles in healthy young men. The other thing that it covers, and this is what I'm going to talk about first, is the drug testing protocol. So for those of you who don't know, CrossFit uses drug-free sport third party. When it's third party, it means that they're going to test the athletes, they're going to give the results to CrossFit, and then CrossFit is going to do what they want with them. We all hope and believe that they give us all the results. They don't have to. They might not. Who knows? That might be something for another day. I've got no reason to believe that they don't, but that is a topic for another day. The topic today is what drug-free sport can find. They use the exact same stuff that organizations like WADA uses. WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency. They're the agency and the organization that will test the Olympics. The Olympics, which is very, very stern. Maybe you heard it in the Joe Rogan, Matt Frazier podcast where he talks about, yeah, they would just sit there and watch me pee. They'd go to class with me so that I couldn't get by with the freaking taking drugs in the Olympics. So WADA is very serious. Drug-free sport uses the same protocol. And when it comes to this article in relation to testosterone, the test is the epitestosterone to testosterone ratio test. Now, as I sit here right now, I have one testosterone per one epitestosterone. And that is something that every single freaking healthy male in the world should have. One to one ratio. Females, if you're watching this, you've got testosterone in you as well. You also have estrogen. Males, we also have estrogen. It's like the varying amounts and it just determines whether or not you're a man or a woman, how much testosterone you've got, how much estrogen you've got, and everyone's got epitestosterone. And WADA or drug free sport, they will have you pee in the cup. And the first thing that they do is they're going to test the ratio of testosterone to epitestosterone. This is how they're going to find if you have man-made testosterone in your system. Because as I sit here, what I've got is what I was born with. It's just one-to-one, -one, as it should be, and that would not get me in trouble on a drug test. What does get you in trouble on a drug test is when that ratio goes over four-to-one. So if I sat here and I had three-to-one testosterone to epitestosterone, I would still be good. But when the second it hits four to one, then there's a secondary test that it has to go through. The secondary test is the one where they're going to break down the testosterone and see if it came from a human or from a plant. If it came from a plant, you know that it wasn't made by you, the human. That's when you get in trouble. You pop for a drug test. You fail your drug test when you've got plant testosterone in you. I believe it comes from a yam. I think they make testosterone from yams. I don't know for sure. Some sort of potato. Potato testosterone. Don't quote me on that. Now, this is a series of tests that has to be done, which is different than finding the other man-made sort of steroids in you. Ones like Anivar or Equipoise or Dianabol or Halo Testin or Trenbolone, any of those, those are easy to find because they're not supposed to be in there. However, there is supposed to be testosterone in here, which is why they have the ratio because otherwise every single person that takes the drug test is going to pop for using performance enhancing drugs. Go down the street, go to the Walgreens, have someone pee in a cup and you say, hey, is there testosterone in this dude? And there's going to be. They don't want to have to test that guy because it becomes expensive. If you take that guy, he pees in the cup, the cheap test test is the testosterone to epitestosterone test, the four to one, one to one, whatever sort of ratio. So you skew that ratio when you put in 
extra testosterone. And that is exactly what this test is doing. It's finding out whether or not, one, a short-term dose of testosterone is effective, and how effective is it? And two, if you're taking a certain amount of testosterone, and in the study, it was 3.5 milligrams per kilogram of testosterone and enthate, if you take that much testosterone, are you going to ding? Are you going to fail a drug test six weeks later after you started taking it? Very interesting study. Let's start talking about it. So now this study was done back in 2007. And back in 2007, there was very little research. And to this day, there is very little research on this exact study, this exact topic. It references a couple of other studies that were done. They cite that they were upwards of 12-week studies, the effects of anabolic steroids and testosterone and then they, in particular, in excess of 600 milligrams per week and upwards of six to 12 weeks. So this study wanted to do the 3.5 milligram per, per kilogram on a male in the six week time domain. So that's rather short when you take into account a cycle of steroids. Typically a cycle of steroids is no shorter than eight weeks and upwards of 20 weeks. And that's what every other study was done. And all of those other studies, of course, that they found that there was a huge benefit with the 600 milligram dosages, which would end up being upwards of six to seven milligrams per kilogram of body weight. We'll talk about it later, but the dosages used on these males ends up being about three so it's about half of the previous studies and it's half of the time domain. And we already talked about the main thing that they wanted to find out was how much of a performance kick were you going to get when doing this sort of thing. The reason that they wanted to do that was because when you extend that window of 12 weeks and in the WADA tested sports, you do a 12 week steroid cycle and you're more likely to get found out because as we found out in the Matt Frazier podcast, as an Olympic athlete, they test you in the off season. So if they're going to send somebody to him, of course, 12 weeks is a longer window than six weeks. Duh. Like you're more likely to get found then. And that's including the clearance times of the stuff. When we talk clearance times, there's half-lives and the longer you are removed from the freaking steroid that you use, the less likely they are to find that steroid. That's cut and dry. Now they wanted to do the six week window. So they wanted to test people on half of the previous dosages that were tested before and half of the time, see the benefit and see whether or not they would fail the drug test at the six week mark. One big note in the introduction is that they reference in the Weatherby study, which was the 600 milligram dosage over the course of 12 weeks is that after the final dose dose was given 12 weeks later, they were using sprint statistics, 30 meter sprints in particular. And 12 weeks after the cycle was done, they had maintained all of their increased performances on their sprinting. Now, that's a big thing to think about when it comes to clearance times and athletes possibly skirting the freaking drug tests. Like, they did everything way back then. They did all of their steroids way back then. And then present day, they're still reaping the rewards 12 weeks after they were done taking them. So for everyone who says that, you're, oh, you took them one time and it's never going to help you ever again, you're freaking idiots. So here are the methods that you got to know. The methods were that it was a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, height measured to the nearest centimeter and weight measured to the nearest tenth of a kilogram. The testosterone and enthate group were given the 3.5 milligrams of testosterone and enthate per kilogram of body weight, and the control group were given an equivalent amount of saline solution. They tested muscular power at weeks 0, 3, and 6. And they did body mass at weeks zero and six. They took urine at weeks zero and week six. That's for the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio. That is the freaking WADA test, the drug-free sport test, if we know CrossFit. They used 18 males for this test. They had 19 and wanted to drop out due to injury. They had to be between the ages of 21 and 35. And when they got that group of males, they had to pair them up based on weight, height, performance measures, chronological age, training age, nationality, and previously reported steroid use, which for all of these guys was zero. None of it. It was all done under a doctor's supervision. That's always important. Remember, never do this stuff. It's freaking gonna kill you. They have a doctor doing it. They were all they all knew what they were getting into. It wasn't like they were blind walking into it. They're like, okay, some of us are gonna be using some testosterone. Thanks for the doctor. Checking blood pressure, heart rate, and all that sort of stuff. Liver function, lipid profile, complete blood count, that good stuff. The stuff that's important, make sure that you're not gonna die. They used a resistance training program, which consisted of two to three resistance training sessions per week across the six week experimental period with 48 hours of rest between the muscle groups that were being worked. Think standard bodybuilding. Upper body was the bench press, the dumbbell press, the shoulder press, the lat pull down, the one arm dumbbell row, the bicep curl, and the tricep dip. Lower exercises included the squat, the leg press, the leg extension, the leg curl, the lunge, to the calf raise. To me, it sounds like they have all of their bases covered on this study. They seem like scientists to me. We like scientists. The two performance metrics that they wanted to use in this six-week study were the one rep max leg press and the 10-second peak 
output on the watt bike. Now you hear this and you think, okay, they're gonna go test a one rep max, but it's even cooler when they take into account that they have a standardized warm up. They say things like strong verbal encouragement was provided to all the athletes to ensure maximum effort. It's just the type of stuff that you put into account. You gotta note down when you do things with the scientific method in these sorts of journal articles to show you that everything is being accounted for here. They tell you that they were ramping these people up. Let's freaking go. They gotta say it scientifically. It's funny. So yeah, with the one rep leg press, they had standardized warm up. They had a procedure to get there under certain time domains so that the tests were done scientifically. They had a warm up for the 10 second bike test. It says that they had a five second ramp up period so that by the time that they started to take your max peak wattage, you were already up to speed. So it wasn't like, oh, here we go. There it is. It was, you're already there by the time they start the window. Everything's accounted for. So those were the performance metrics being tested. They also were testing the urine we know at week zero into week six at which they took the samples and they they froze them at negative 20 degrees Celsius. They were tested at the National Association of Testing Authorities in Australia with the method being gas chromography and mass spectrometry. Deeper here is that they standardized the eating and the living conditions for these people. And by eating, I mean that they are now giving them all of their food over the course of these six weeks so that they aren't having a various diet, which as we know, would affect the outcome of this test. They are also given a standardized whey protein supplement. You have to take this in the morning and you have to take this in the evening. Before the times in which they are doing their testing, they have a certain meal that they've got to eat one hour before that's even deeper. So they're just trying to make sure they have all of their bases covered. Standardized living. They all had to live in exactly the same situation. They had to also limit their activity outside of the training stimuluses. Physical activity outside of training was limited to light organized social activities to minimize any interference with the training program. Now the last base that they have to have covered is the entire injection protocol. So they were injecting them in the glutes and the butt. They were doing so with a registered nurse. They didn't want the people to see. So essentially they would freaking bend them over a table and they would inject them right there. They weren't able to look back and possibly see that it was a different color or whatever so that they would skew the results. They didn't know what was going into them. There was just something going into them. Like as we said, it was either the testosterone or it was the saline solution. The mental edge is a big one. And if you know that you're on something, maybe it's going to give you a boost and they didn't want to take that into place. So they had a nurse do it for them at the beginning of each week. Big difference. Awesome study. So now some very important information on the study, which I haven't told you yet, and I know I told you that I would say later, was that they are all about 24 years in age, give or take two or three years per the study's information. They are all about 79 kilograms. The weight average was about 170 to 175. The average height was about 181 centimeters, which is about 5'11", 5 5 foot 11 inches. I wanted to bring those up right then and right there because the first thing I want to address is the gain in body mass just over the course of six weeks. So here's the little chart, the little chart, the bars show the standard deviation of the different sub but what you can see is that the black bars are the testosterone bars and the white bars are the placebo bars. And the placebo bars stay relatively similar over the course of the white weeks. The black bars, you can see at six weeks, it is quite a bit higher than the initial black bar. And that gain shows that they had gained some body mass over the course of that period of time. And that was just body weight. We come on over to the bench press. They show you at week zero, three, and six, they tested the bench press. At each of those weeks, the white bars, being the placebo group, they're all relatively similar. Maybe they go up just slightly. The black bars, there's a pretty big jump from week zero to week three. And then from week three to week six, there's an even bigger jump. And it's much, much, much bigger than any slight increase of the white bars. Anything that you would expect from somebody who's not using performance enhancing drugs. Interestingly enough, the 1RM leg press, you see that the increase between the the testosterone and the placebo group is that they're relatively similar. In the discussion area of the study, they chalk this up to training history. That's speculation, but what you can see from the data is that the leg press strength of the individuals increased whether or not they were taking the testosterone. And while that might be the case, when we go to the bike test, you can look at peak power. And peak power of the testosterone group, it goes up at weeks three and week six in relation to the testosterone group, while the placebo group goes up, but it goes up slightly again, like you would expect back just slightly week after week, along with the total work done over the course of their time spent on the bike. So huge, huge increases from the testosterone group when compared to the control group. Those being again, the standard little jumps that you'll see on those white bars. And then finally, the thing that you've all been waiting for, I talked about in the beginning, what this whole thing was, the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio test, why everybody's on freaking steroids, uh, yeah, everyone's on steroids, quote unquote. The study started off with a bunch of people and it would appear that the people 
people who had dropped off due to whatever reasons they dropped off or personal injury, they were in the placebo group. So in the placebo group, all the little black bars over there, you can see that they're all falling under that dotted bar, which is the cutoff line for the four to one ratio. On the left side, you'll see the white bars. The white bars on the left side are the testosterone group. So they took the testosterone and that's where their ratios are at. When they're at 11, for an example, that means that they have 11 to one. Blew the drug test. They're going secondary. Secondary testing to see what sort of testosterone that was. You see there are some as high as would appear to be 37. 37 to one. That's no good. You failed the freaking drug test. Then you'll see that there are testosterone groups there. There are one, two, three, four of them out of the nine who they didn't know they were doing this. They didn't know that this was part of the entire protocol. They didn't know literally anything. All they knew is they were either taking testosterone or they weren't. They were working out and they were peeing in a cup. Just knowing that four people passed the drug test. They passed a drug test where they were taking three times TRT amount of a 35 to 80 year old man. You go to the doctor, you get TRT, you're taking 100 to 200 milligrams a week. And in this test, they were taking upwards of 320 milligrams per week. If they were a 200 pound man, that's the amount of testosterone that they were taking. And there were people in this test who were doing that. And it would appear that four out of the nine people in this test passed the drug test with flying colors and they did it on accident. Those who conducted this study clearly note that this is an issue. They say up until this point, there were no other studies done on the T to E ratio. None at all. Not a single one. So they were the first ones to look into this in this freaking study right here, right now. And they say it's an issue because four people are getting by out of nine, which is basically half of the people, basically half, a little less than half, but still almost half. And they were seeing benefits in as little as three weeks. So they didn't even need the six weeks. They could have done 300 milligrams of testosterone, three weeks, don't do that. They could have done it though, seen all of these improvements. And then the study above, remember we talked about the 12 week study, they saw the improvements 12 weeks later. So they can get those benefits, see those increases, and they can be on the drug at the point in time in which they were taking the test and still pass the test. Four out of nine of them at least. And you're gonna ask, why is it that some people have ratios so freaking high and some are passed with flying colors? Everyone's different. Everyone reacts to everything differently. I don't know that much about that end of everything. But I do know some people are born to be freaking huge. Not everyone's going to look like the mountain. Some people are born to run marathons. Some people have harder time losing weight than others. This is all stuff that is just the way you're born. So some people are born and they express the TDE ratio differently than other people when they're introduced to anabolic steroids. And that's really all I can say about that. But it is clear, and the study talks about this, the study says that there's a huge test, a huge hole in this, that people can literally be using performance enhancing drugs at the time they take the drug drug test and still pass the drug test. I have said it a thousand times within this, that it's as clear as day, well done a study as you can conduct. You can't argue this. Unarguable. Pee in this cup. Oh, good for you. Nice job. Bench press went all that high. Your bench press went that high and you're not anything good for you. It's like, well, what do you mean? I'm on everything. Freaking stupid. And you're telling me that these people didn't know. So let's say that there's an athlete who's trying to skirt the standards. They know. And they're just like, all right, well, if they can get away with this, like what can they get away with? Who knows what they can get away with? They can get away with murder. This study provides evidence of the ability of anabolic androgenic steroids to enhance muscle strength and power within weeks of beginning administration. Additionally, the WADA imposed urinary TDE ratio of 4 to 1 did not identify all the athletes who were administered testosterone and in the study. The findings of the study suggest that the some athletes may be able to use testosterone and anthony to significantly enhance their performance without it testing positive. Right there, practical application. What does that mean? It means that there are definitely, definitely people who are using steroids in the sport, any sport, not just CrossFit, the MLB, the NFL, the NBA, and they can clearly get away with it. They probably have doctors doing their blood work for them on the side, but hey, am I gonna pass this drug test? And like, oh yeah, you'll pass it. Ooh, you might not pass it. Take a little bit less. Oh, you should pass it. Take a little bit more. And again, this isn't me telling everybody how to do things. Like that's freaking stupid. Don't do any of this crap. Don't do it. You're gonna die. I said that in the last video with the interview with the CrossFitter. Don't do it because you're gonna freaking die. They had doctors in this study. They were freaking scientists conducting the study. I don't want anyone saying, oh, I did this thing and Andrew said it was okay. It's like I'm not saying it's okay. I'm saying it's not okay. Don't be freaking idiot. All I want to do is tell you that anybody who argues that everyone in the sport of CrossFit or the sport of basketball, MLB, football is clean, the UFC, they're freaking idiots and they don't know what they're talking about. And this study clearly shows it clear as day. People who didn't know what they were doing, freaking flag on the drug test. That's all we want to say. I hope you found this thing interesting. I hope you like the scientific evidence. And if you want to try to argue with me, go ahead because you're going to freaking lose. Andrew Hiller out.